Grim news is being forecast about the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo that's now being called the worst in the country's history. The United Nations is poised to lift a nearly decade-old arms embargo and targeted sanctions on Eritrea. We'll have the details. And using a technology platform to save the world's most endangered species in Tanzania. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. The World Health Organization delivered some unsettling news to the Democratic Republic of Congo on Wednesday, warning that the Ebola outbreak in the country's northeast, which has already killed more than 200 people, is expected to last until mid-2019. In Congo's North Kiva province, there are more than 300 confirmed and probable cases of the deadly virus, making it the worst in Congo's history. So there are several hundred what they call tradi modern or traditional modern health facilities in Beni. They have never been mapped. They're not regulated by the Ministry of Health. They're private facilities uh, that are really business ventures. And uh, those facilities um, are, we believe, one of the major drivers of the ongoing transmission. Probably more than 50% of cases in Beni have been driven from these tradi modern healthcare facilities. And the fact that hygiene and injection practices in these areas are relatively unsafe. Well, the location of the disease is perhaps the most difficult uh, the WHO has ever encountered due to the dense and mobile local population and insecurity caused by two armed groups. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says the effects of a possible drought predicted in the southern African region can be reduced if countries invest in irrigation. The prediction comes at a time when Zimbabwe's farmers are appealing for assistance so they can move away from depending on rain-fed agriculture. Columbus Mavonga reports from Harare. The 2018-2019 rainy season is expected to start any time in Zimbabwe, but the UN Food and Agriculture Organization is warning that crops may not get the water they need. An El Nino weather pattern is predicted in the Pacific, and that often means less than average rainfall in southern Africa. Preparations for planting are underway at Magutu Farm, about 40 kilometers north of Harare. But 59-year-old farmer Tsitsi Majori Makaya says her nearby farm isn't ready. She is a beneficiary of Zimbabwe's land reform program that has displaced most white farmers since 2000. But she lacks the equipment, including irrigation pipes, to make her 26.9 hectares more productive. We are trying to so they take one seventy two one away. I also need electricity here, and I do not have the resources to put up an irrigation facility on the farm because it is expensive. According to the FAO sub-regional coordinator for Southern Africa, Patrick Omawa, the agency has rehabilitated several irrigation projects in Zimbabwe. Still, most farms are at the mess of rain. We have less than 11% of all the land that is cultivated in Africa under irrigation. Most countries rely on rainfall, rain-fed um, agriculture. And when the rain fails, of course the crops fail. And this also has effects on the food security as well as the income of the people. The FAO envoy says African countries need to invest in irrigation so food security and agricultural income are not so severely affected by drought. Komawa says even smallholder irrigation plans improve food security and income in countries where agriculture is the backbone of the economy. The last El Nino induced drought from 2014 to 2016 led to 40 million people requiring food assistance from across Southern Africa. Columbus Mavunga for VOA News, Harare. 
of the United Nations Security Council has voted unanimously on Wednesday to lift a nearly decade-old arms embargo and targeted sanctions on Eritrea. Uh, this move follows a resumption of harmonious relations with Ethiopia and improving of relations with Djibouti. Diplomats speaking on condition of anonymity say the 15-member council completed negotiations on Monday and agreed on a British drafted resolution to remove the sanctions which were imposed in 2009 after UN experts accused Eritrea of supporting armed groups in Somalia. Eritrea has denied the accusations. The resolution received nine votes in favor and no votes, uh, no vetoes by the United States, China, Russia, Britain or France. Now for more on what the lifting of sanctions by the UN means, I'm joined by VOA journalist at World uh, Tesfa Gabir, who covers East Africa. It's world, welcome back to Africa 54. Thank you, Mr. for having me. So first, uh, uh, as a person also from Eritrea, what does this feel like for an Eritrean for the sanctions to, to be lifted? What, do you, what are you hearing? Well, it um, can be a mixed feeling, uh, but mostly um, for those Eritreans who have been campaigning uh, for the lifting of these sanctions, it's a great excitement, mm -hmm. uh, including the government. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has been uh, almost 10 years on arms and uh, other economic uh, sanctions on Eritrea. Yeah. And the impact was enormous, according to the Eritrean officials recently tweeting. Now, you were there in Eritrea not long ago. You came back. Uh, so first, what are some of the visible impacts uh, for, of, of these sanctions? Uh, to what extent have they really affected people's day-to-day -day livelihoods? I mean, it's an arms embargo, of course, we know that. But how, how did that have Not any only on arms embargo, basically it has uh, an impact on the economic uh, life of the country. Uh, basically, the, uh, the harassment of uh, mining companies mm -hmm. and uh, the cost of loans, insurance, uh, when the government won't take a loan, uh, there's always uh, a cost of insurance. Yes. And uh, all this... Um, um, what they call economic impact was enormous. It was it cannot be overlooked. Mm -hmm. Now, the what we're hearing is that um, this actually came because of the changing dynamics there. We're seeing a relationship has improved with Ethiopia, and also in uh, Djibouti, things are changing there. How? What led to the changes, which have actually been uh, now confirmed through the United Nations lifting of sanctions? The dynamism has been there for in the recent years, uh, but basically uh, after um, the current administration of Ethiopia accepted the Algiers agreement to implement the border decision with Eritrea, uh, Eritrea replied positively and now the diplomatic uh, frenzy or excitement is very high. Uh, that can be uh, the main reason led to the peace in the region where a security council also uh, reacted positively and that led to the lifting of this sanction. Yeah. So we know the tension was not only between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, there was also uh, Eritrea and Djibouti. Right. Uh, and, and, and so uh, in terms of the effect it has had on the people in the entire region, uh, you know, what would this mean now, just for the right. ordinary citizens? Right. right. Um, as you know, um, the sanctions were uh, because of when well, the Security Council said that Eritrea was supporting uh, the armed groups in Somalia, as well as uh, refusal of its troops from the border uh, with Djibouti uh, after they fought in 2008. Um, so basically now um, the dynamism of the region has been changed recently and uh, the uh, presidents of Eritrea and Djibouti met in Saudi Arabia recently and they agreed to, to tower to improve their uh, relations. Um, so the, the excitement, the diplomatic friends, as I said, is not as, as, um, as big as has happened with Ethiopia, yeah. but it looks like the relationship has been improved with Djibouti also. Okay, so this might have some uh, positive impact on the overall economy of the country and also uh, the geopolitical uh, di dynamics, but uh, in terms of uh, the lives of the people of Eritrea, there have been other concerns, and you were there in Ethiopia, but I mean in Eritrea. Right. There have been concerns over the years about uh, the system of government, uh, perhaps the issue of democracy and transparency, human rights. Is any of that changed in the last few months, uh, at least 
from what you saw? The hope among Eritreans is very high. Uh, they are hoping the changes uh, happening in Ethiopia uh, will lead uh, also a change at home in, in Eritrea. Uh, many Eritreans are hoping that, um, especially they are asking questions whether um, the national service uh, in Eritrea uh, is going to be changed uh, somehow, uh, national service program, um, which uh, is compulsory, and because of that, many have been subjected perfect. to a lot right, of persecution. Right, right. right. because um, not only that, um, the political system can, the hope in the political system can also be changed. Yeah. But basically, at the moment, the priority what's happening now is in economic impact. Yeah. They, they just feel in the economic impact, the economic uh, relief somehow. Yeah. Um, the, the, the cost of the consumer goods, especially mm -hmm. uh, non durable uh, um, goods like yeah. food, yeah. Um, the cost has been very low now. Mm -hmm. The reconnection of uh, Ethiopian Eritrean. Uh, in the border it's going to improve that is happening right now yeah. so Thank you. basically the political change and the question is very slow yeah but the hope is high well let's hope things change and the hope uh, turns into reality thanks a lot to Walder for joining us today thank you for having me it's a pleasure well our viewers journalist uh to uh, Tesfa Gabir well, plans by South Africa's ruling African National Congress to change the Constitution to allow the expropriation of land without compensation have unnerved investors. That's according to a senior World Bank uh, Group executive. And most private land remains in the hands of white minority more than two decades after the end of apartheid, making it a, a vivid symbol of wider disparities. Public hearings on land redistribution were held earlier this year across South Africa, attracting large crowds and often emotional testimony. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa told uh, the European Parliament Wednesday that South Africa will enact land reforms in a adherence to the country's constitution and with respect for the human rights of all its people. We have said very clearly that this problem of land will be resolved through adherence to the rule of law, through adherence to our constitution, and we will utilize the lessons that Nelson Mandela taught us with regard to resolving problems. We will resolve this problem in an inclusive basis, respecting each other's human rights. Well, Ramaphosa added that Europe and South Africa must work together to address the root causes of irregular migration. To East Africa now, uh, Kenya outlaws homosexuality, considering it a crime against nature, punishable by up to 14 years in prison. But authorities are more supportive of Kenyans who, are uh, who were born with both or ambiguous sex organs, intersex people. A government task force formed last year has been asked to make recommendations for laws and policies to protect intersex people from discrimination and hate. Rylan Boer has more from Nairobi. Born 29 years ago as Ruth Muihaki, Ryan Murori faced stigma and abuse and attempted suicide three times before taking on his new identity as a man. Ryan says his bad memories started at the age of five. I'm not attracted to any girls' games. So my life had been all alone. I was all alone without friends, without interacting with boys at the same time with girls. Until when now I get the age of puberty, that's where the things turns allowed. It turns allowed to me, like all my expectation was in vain, like um, maybe expected to grow like a normal girl, you know, to have breasts, to have hips and all that. But that never happens. Um, instead, I started becoming masculine. Kenyan Senator Isaac Maura has asked his colleagues in parliament to pass a motion signaling support for intersex people. When I started out, we didn't know the right terminology. Because if you look at my motion, it is gender identity disorder. And when I was told about the issue of intersex, I was a bit hesitant because the only time I had heard about intersex people was in relation to LGBT, uh, so LGBTI. And, you know, it's an anathema to discuss those things in this country. A 2009 birth of a baby with ambiguous genitalia at a Nairobi hospital forced the issue of intersex people into the courts. Hospital staff put a question mark 
next to the box designating the gender, and the child was not given a birth certificate. In 2014, a court ordered the government to issue a birth certificate to the child and ordered the Attorney General to name a task force that will develop policies for support of intersex persons. Petronila Mukanda is a member of the task force, which completed its work last month. We as a task force uh, recommend that um, you know, there be recognition of intersex persons right from birth. So can we have a marker, an intersex marker I? Meanwhile, Maura is working to amend two laws, the Registration of Persons and the Registration of Births and Deaths Acts. Right now, all Kenyans must be listed as male or female under those acts. The proposed amendment will make intersex a third category. Rai Lombor for VOA News, Nairobi. Well, as you know, a Somalian refugee now living in Iceland runs a YouTube channel that advocates women's rights, especially for Somalian girls and women. Francesca Lino has the story. She may now live thousands of miles away in Iceland, but high school student Nijmo is still communicating with women back in her homeland. And she's doing that through YouTube, hoping to inspire girls facing the same struggles as she has. The videos I do is to inspire young people in general, especially to empower women, because Somalian women is have, have no right to speak. Nijmo was given little choice when she was just 13 years old, forced into an arranged marriage to a man three times her age. She fled Somalia, making the treacherous journey across the Sahara and the Mediterranean, and eventually finding asylum with a family in Reykjavik. To sometimes just look at them and say, you know, we're not the same color, we're not the same country, we're not even the same religion. And we're still family and take care of each other and love each other. And I do ask myself again, why can't the world be exactly as we are here in this family? From her bedroom, Nijmo runs her social media channel, which has nearly 19,000 subscribers, hoping to unpick taboo topics such as forced marriage and women's rights in Somalia. And she doesn't only broach these subjects on social media. Nijmo recently travelled to Denmark, where she spoke at an Amnesty Youth Conference. Well, that was Francesca Linoff of Reuters reporting. Want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover? Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOFBiz and Corey. Still ahead on Africa 54. Using technology to safeguard Tanzania's endangered wildlife. But first, a look at Wednesday's headlines. Certainly we're planning on at least another six months before we could declare this outbreak over. He has committed to support the national conference. Last month, we told you about the U.S. military's new strategy to expand education initiatives for non-commissioned military officers. The champion of, the, of that plan is Command Chief Master Sergeant Ramon Colon Lopez, the Command Senior Enlisted Leader for U.S. Africa Command, who recently hosted an African Senior Enlisted Leaders Conference in Germany. He sat down exclusively with VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb to talk about what uh, this new plan means for the continent as well as the U.S. military's role in stopping growing threats from disease to piracy. The number of U.S. military people in Africa is about half of just the country of Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, so we're not trying to blow anything out of proportion here, but there does seem to be an increased focus all of a sudden in Africa. Would you agree with that and why is that? 
Well, when you look at the presence, you know, whether it's UN, uh, NATO, us, the United States, the French, the, the UK, um, we're really interested in peacekeeping operations rather than contingency operations. And it's not only military actions, you know, we have the current Ebola outbreak in the DRC to where we're helping those agencies, you know, to the greatest extent possible to be able to contain the threat, because now you have uh, neighboring countries, Uganda, as an example, that are concerned that the disease is going to go ahead and cross the border. So everything that we do in Africa is, is a targeted, focused approach in a limited capacity, because we do not have the assets to do everything that we would like to do in the continent. Since you mentioned the DRC, mm -hmm. Has the U.S. military been formally asked to come in and help with the Ebola crisis yet? We have not. You know, we have other agencies like the World Health Organization, you know, that is clearly helping USAID. And remember that those are agencies that work hand in hand with Africa Command. Because I recently made a comment that uh, when I look at Africa Command, you know, it doesn't quite sound like a combatant command. It's, it's more like a collaboration command. And you're very passionate on training the enlisted forces. Tell my international audience why that's so important. The enlisted forces comprise, on an average, about 80% of any military. We have underinvested as a command on enlisted development for quite an amount of time. Uh, the initial response that I got from some of our people and our staff was, well, the Africans are not demanding enlisted development. When I had this forum last year, I found out the opposite. They're asking for it, but they're not getting it. So how do we get to professionally develop in them? And that's when I came up with the idea of regionalizing. Let's go ahead and see what we can do. Small targeted investments that will give us immediate results or tangible results to show that, hey, we're making progress in Africa. Ghana is one of the countries that you, you are focusing on um, with your program. They've been in an area that's been seeing an increase in piracy. How can the United States direct more resources, and why is it such an important problem to stem? to stem? Well, you know, when you look at counter piracy efforts in the continent, the U.S. has been pretty silent in the last few years because we have helped quite a bit for them to be able to create their forces. They have gotten equipment training that helps them train for such uh, contingencies. Do you think we'll see something similar to how the United States helped with the Somali coast happening over on the Gulf of Guinea? That can potentially happen, yes. I mean, but uh, again, everything has to be at the request of the host government, and uh, right now we uh, don't have a demand. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the Chinese influence? Has, have you seen any military uh, inroads on the continent between the Chinese and African counterparts? You know, the Chinese are in Africa, it's no secret. They have a, a, an extensive presence, they're building schools, stadiums, roads, uh, railways, uh, and they also have a limited military presence, and in some cases they're training African militaries. Uh, but the one thing that I will say is that there's not a single African in that room right now, or 51 of them, that will tell you that they have the same relationship that they have with me, with any Chinese uh, non-commissioned officer. It is non-existent, and that's the relationship power that we have with our partners. Well, that was VOA Pentagon correspondent Calabab speaking with Chief Master Sergeant Ramon Colon Lopez of AFRICOM. Well... Well, in Tanzania, protecting endangered animals has become easier thanks to Earth Ranger. Now, Earth Ranger is not a superhero. It's a technology platform developed by Vulcan Incorporated, a company co-founded by U.S. philanthropist and Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen. The system helps rangers remotely monitor elephants and other animals to stay ahead of poachers. Faisal Masri produced the story, and viewers Faith Lapidus narrates. Elephants are among the most endangered animals in the world, a result of ivory poaching, which has caused the population to drop 20 percent between 2006 and 2015. But now, in the Grumeti Game Reserve in Tanzania, elephants roam freely and safely, as every one is outfitted with a tracking collar. Rangers in the operation room depend on the Earth Ranger tech platform to follow each elephant. In its early stages of development, the platform was named the Domain Awareness System, or DAS. Well, what we do with DAS is we monitor all our assets, every colored animal, and we also input data, which in turn helps us make decisions and plan um, operations. 
When threats are detected, the system alerts the rangers who are following the data. Earth Ranger allows you to, uh, it takes you from being, uh, from being reactive and always behind and always after an animal has been killed or a ranger has been injured or killed to being proactive, to really being able to anticipate and get ahead of the problem. Earth Ranger not only saves the lives of the elephants, it also protects the staff on the reserve from poachers. Constant and fast communication with the control room makes the ranger's tasks easier and safer. And it helps them use their resources more efficiently and effectively. The developers hope Earth Ranger will provide conservationists in the region the network they need to work together and save Africa's wildlife. For writer Faiza El Masri, I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. This year, the number of smartphone users worldwide is expected to top 3 billion. Imelda Mumbi user, uh, uses her smartphone to complement her studies. For the 13-year-old who recently took her primary school final exams, the Kenya Certificate of Primary Education, the Inesa education application on her smartphone, has become a key resource for advancing her studies. The interactive educational app, which has about 3 million users, worldwide allows its users access to courses and quizzes almost exclusively by text messages for a cost of just 10 Kenyan shillings per, per week. Meanwhile, in Russia, an eco-fashion designer truly believes that one man's trash is another man's treasure. After uh, Brazil has been creating clothes and costumes out of recyclable materials known as upcycling for years, preferring those that, uh, that damage the nature uh, the most, like plastic bottles and bags, aluminum cans and construction waste. Once in a while he visits junkyards and dumps near his home, not only for inspiration, but also to collect things and materials to give them a second life. Brazi and his works have won several Russian fashion contests, including Russian Silhouette a prestigious award for new fashion designers for his collection of costumes made out of newspapers. Well, next up, Game of Thrones fans rejoice. HBO's international mega hit will debut its eighth and final season starting in April. The network announced in a trailer released online on Tuesday, the video featured footage from previous seasons to recap the costly battles that preceded the coming showdown for control of uh, the fictional kingdom of Westeros. And the network did not reveal a specific date for the final season's premiere. Several spin-offs of this series are in the works, HBO has given a plot, uh, pilot order to a prequel uh, that will take place thousands of years before the events of the current series. And that's what's trending today. Well, and that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at viewafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show African News tonight. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. English in a minute. Liquid boils when it is heated to a certain temperature. Boils down to this. So Jonathan and Anna are probably talking about cooking. Or are they? I got a job offer. That's great. Congratulations. Thanks. But the job is in California. All my friends and family are here in DC. Look. 